There is no news of her condition and as yet the report is unconfirmed. It's also reported that a passenger in the princess's car was killed. One report, quoting French police, says it is her friend Dodi Al-Fayed. It's also reported that the driver of the princess's car was killed. I repeat that these reports are unconfirmed. We will bring you more news as soon as we have it. We are getting reports that Diana, Princess of Wales, has been badly injured in a car crash in France. French radio is saying that the accident happened in western Paris when the car in which she was travelling collided with another vehicle in a tunnel. The princess is reported to have been taken to hospital. There is no news of her condition and as yet the reports are unconfirmed. It is also reported that a passenger in the princess's car was killed. One report quoting French police says that is her friend Dodi Al-Fayed. It's also reported that the driver of the princess's car was killed. I repeat that these reports are unconfirmed. We will bring you more information when we have it. Of course, there'll be more news reports over on BBC One. A look now at the weather here on BBC Two with Rob McElwee. It's been reported in the last few minutes that Diana, Princess of Wales, has been seriously injured in a car crash in Paris. A man believed to be the Harrods heir, Dodi Fayed, is reported to have been killed. The accident is believed to have happened as the car they were travelling in was going through a tunnel on a road alongside the River Seine. French officials say the couple were being chased by paparazzi. We'll bring you more details on this as we get them. Yes, Nick, as you said, uh, the princess has been visited in hospital, according to French police sources, by the French interior minister and by the British consul in Paris. But we still don't have any information on how seriously she's been injured. Yep. We have to assume that uh, she's been quite okay. badly hurt. Where is he? We have to assume that she's been quite badly hurt because of the death of Dodi Al-Fayed, who was sitting next to her in the car, and the death of the driver. What we don't yet know is how many other people were involved. As you said, uh, police were still at the scene uh, more than an hour after the crash occurred, cutting other people free from the wreckage, and there was a bit of a pile-up within the tunnel where the crash took place. George, for the moment, thank you very much indeed. Well, on the line from Paris is our correspondent, Kevin Connolly. Kevin, what uh, are the latest details you're getting? The very latest is that you can gauge the seriousness of this crash and the fact that people are still being cut from some of the vehicles involved uh, inside the tunnel that runs uh, under the Pont d'Alma on one of the expressways that runs beside the River Seine. We are still only being told that the Princess of Wales is seriously injured, although I suppose some encouragement must be taken from the fact that she has been visited in hospital already. Um, and as you know already, her companion Dodi El Fayed and the driver from the Ritz Hotel in Paris were being told, we were being told very soon after the accident happened, had been killed. So obviously a very grave accident. Still no concrete word on exactly what the condition of the princess is, but perhaps some indication that um, there are grounds for optimism from the fact that she's been visited. Buckingham Palace is uh, alluding to the fact that she was being pursued by photographers. Photographers in Paris do have a reputation for being very aggressive in this kind of situation. Uh, what is your um, perception of how they do work in a situation like this? Well, there is no doubt that not just in France, but elsewhere in Europe too, perhaps particularly in some parts of France, in this very competitive freelance photography market where a single image can make many, many thousands of pounds, international stars, as the Princess of Wales has become, are the subject of almost intolerable pressure. Their movements are very, very closely monitored. The paparazzi always seem to know where they are. Chasing them, hounding them even, is standard practice. It's been being said from the very first moment that details of the crash began to emerge that that is in effect how it happened. If that is confirmed, as police put, put together a more accurate picture of how the crash 
came about, then clearly there will be great anger, not just at Buckingham Palace, but across Britain and elsewhere in the world too. Kevin Connolly in Paris for the moment. Thank you very much indeed. And I'm now joined by James Whitaker, who is the royal correspondent for the Mirror newspaper. James, we were hearing there from Kevin the kind of way in which the, the paparazzi do work in this kind of situation. From your experience, how much evasive action tends to be taken by those like the princess in this kind of situation? Yes, a great deal of action is taken. But when she is driven in this country, she seems to have uh, drivers, I know one of whom is very senior, ex-Scotland Yard, who is highly trained to move with the passenger on board, Diana, in a very fast, positive manner, but never to put her life at risk. And I find it so wrong to say that the paparazzi caused this accident. I mean, I don't know the circumstances of it, but there's one thing with the paparazzi following a carload of them, apparently. Very often, you know, they work on motorbikes on their own anyway. Okay, that's not much fun, but the driver doesn't have to drive in such a way that an accident is then caused. It's trite to say that it's their, their fault on this, and I would... The, I, I would OK, I accept that it's not a lot of fun, but to blame the paparazzi completely, it's the old, old business of when something goes wrong, blame the press. OK, James, well, let's not blame the press. Let's merely say that uh, Princess Diana in the car with Dodi al Fayed was uh, at least being pursued in some form yeah. by, uh, by uh, photographers who traditionally in Paris tend to be pretty aggressive. And let's, let's leave it at that for the moment. But when, when Princess Diana has been driven around in the past, how often is she actually driven or has she been driven by those who have very precise training, uh, advanced police drivers, for example? Well, of course, when, when she was the Princess of Wales, um, up until her divorce, which is almost exactly a year ago, yes, she had drivers who were highly trained. They were trained by um, uh, people from the Hendon School of Motoring. They were also taught by uh, they were th themselves, the Prince of Wales and Diana, have been taught by SAS-trained people how to reverse cars fast. They themselves, not just their drivers, who of course are trained too, they are given pretty extensive training as to how to move very fast through traffic in a safe manner. I have to say that I've known the princess for 18 years or so now, and I remember her as a very young person, 18 or 19 years old, when she first came on the scene with the Prince of Wales in 1980, so that's 17 years ago, she herself would drive very fast, again, to avoid photographers and press in those days. She herself is a naturally fast, fairly aggressive driver, but of course, she wasn't properly trained. She has since been trained to do this, and the people who do drive her now are very highly tuned. I don't know about the French person at all who did it. Um, maybe he didn't have the sort of training that uh, the princess would have had from people in this country who drove her. But inevitably we have to talk about this because it is about the security uh, of uh, Princess Diana. Uh, what is your... Uh, you've been following her now, as you say, for so many years, but you've actually watched her from the kind of pens where journalists have to be kept. You've watched her. You've travelled um, in the same planes as her. You've also... Yeah been able to compare how she's been able to operate recently uh, compared to when she was formerly still married to Prince Charles. Has there been a loosening, an acceptance that in some way she has something of a normal life now, which means that she doesn't actually have to have the kind of security you've just been describing? Indeed. Well, of course, I've felt, if you remember, I think it was December 92, she actually abandoned all security that was provided by the Metropolitan Police at Scotland Yard. She never had SAS. People used to say SAS around them. They don't. It's, it's Metropolitan Police. She dropped them. She said that they were restricting her life. She didn't want them. And she has not had an official bodyguard since. The only time she does is when she's on an official engagement or when she travels overseas uh, on official business or 
when the boys are with her, William and Harry. And she has security then because they're there to provide it for the Prince William and Prince Harry, not for her. But of course, as they're nearby, they also look after her. So she chose not to have this sort of security. But on planes, yes, I've traveled with her on planes. People provide security for her without her asking for it. I mean, for example, if she goes on a flight on a British Airways aircraft, there will be a security man from BA who's sitting pretty close to her to make sure nothing untoward goes on. In fact, in the few years since she's given them up, I think there's been a very little... Um, unnecessary attention certainly from the public on her i remember once she was in a shop in uh, in smith's i think it was in kensington high street and somebody came up pestering her saying uh, you're you're the princess of wales aren't you and she it was foreign i can't remember what nationality and she rather brushed him away and said no 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 that's not me i, I mean it was a sort of white lie to get rid of them but in fact there have been very very few incidents where she has been pestered. I mean, she's very quick-witted herself, Nick. She can, she can talk her way out of things pretty well. She has this enormous charm where she can get rid of people, too. It sort of worked for her. We have to discuss security now, James, not to betray it, but to, because it obviously is an issue at this moment. When you look at the last uh, few months, and particularly what has happened since she began uh, her friendship with Dodi al Fayed, particularly when people like you were down in the Mediterranean with her yeah. uh, on her first trip to the sun, when uh, yeah. the first signals came through that uh, a relationship of some kind had been building. What was your impression then, I think that was Mallorca, and then later around Sardinia, of how much security there was with her? Or was it that discreet or that minimalist that really there no. wasn't any? No, it was obvious that there was security there. In fact, it was in Saint-Tropez when um, she first went on holiday with Mohammed Al-Fayed, his wife, Heine, and, of course, Dodi was there, plus other children of Mr. Al-Fayed's. Yes, you could see these, quotes heavies around the beach. There would be two or three of them because Mr. Al-Fayed himself has a lot of security. He is, as many people have said, a controversial figure, and he needs a lot of protection, or he feels he does anyway. Yes, one was aware of them very much being there. But she also had a security su supplied by um, Scotland Yard on this occasion because, of course, the boys, William and Harry, were with her. So they were around too. But they do it very well, the Scotland Yard people. It's not over the top. And I always have a, a feeling that... Um, Others who are not trained, particularly with the royal family, are rather heavy-handed. I mean, I understand that Mr. al security are ex-SAS people, tough as blazes and very good in a brawl. But I'm not sure they're particularly the right sort of people to be protecting members of the royal family or even ex-members like Diana was. Uh, the Scotland Yard people are pretty good. They are very trained in it, and they're not obvious. In fact, they look smarter often than uh, the principals they're meant to be guarding. They're beautifully dressed, they have good manners, and um, uh, they dress exactly right for each occasion. They don't look like gorillas. James Whitaker, while we've been uh, talking, we have been seeing pictures, the latest pictures coming in from the scene at the Pont d'Alma in Paris, where there has been an accident involving Princess Diana, uh, in which her friend Dodi al Fayed has been confirmed as being killed. We can now get the latest details from Paris, from uh, one of our other correspondents uh, in our studio here, George Arney. George, what is the latest information you are getting? We haven't heard anything new from Paris, in fact, in the last five or ten minutes. There has been some reaction from across the Atlantic, where President Clinton and his wife Hillary uh, were informed uh, about the crash and about the injuries which Princess Diana has sustained. Uh, they're on vacation at Martha's Vineyard on the East Coast. They are said to be very concerned and have asked to be kept informed about the progress of the princess. But there's been no information at all about the nature of her injuries. All we know is that the French interior minister and the British consul in Paris have visited her in hospital, but we don't know how seriously she's injured yet, nor do we yet know how many other people were involved in the crash in the tunnel. We do know that, of course, that her companion Dodi Fayed was killed, um, as was the driver of the car. 
We know that Princess Diana's bodyguard was injured, as was the princess, but there were a number of other people involved in the uh, wreckage after the pileup occurred in the tunnel. We don't know how many of those may have been injured or indeed killed. George, for the moment, uh, thank you very much indeed. Well, I'm now joined from another of our London studios by the BBC's former royal correspondent, Paul Reynolds. Paul, you probably heard the end of a conversation I was having there with James Whitaker, the royal correspondent of the Mirror newspaper, who travelled and has travelled, like you, recently uh, with Princess Diana, him for up to 18 years, and we were discussing their security. What is your impression of the risks that have been taken by Princess Diana in recent months with these kind of trips she's been making with Dodi al Faid? Well, I think the question you know, that we want answering at the moment is whether this crash was caused by a car chase involving the paparazzi, the photographers who invade her life, especially at the moment, uh, because of her relationship uh, with Mr. Al Fayed over the last uh, few weeks. Well, James Whitaker, who you might have heard just before you got into the studio there, was saying a moment ago that he rather resented the suggestion that it was the paparazzi mm. per se, the French paparazzi, uh, who were the cause yeah. of this, because this happens all the time. Yes, I'm not laying the finger of blame at this stage, and uh, one will have to await uh, full police reports from Paris. But this is the, f you ask about security, the first thing one has to say is that the threat to her security, such as it is, uh, seems to come from the photographers. There's a lot of money to be made from her. She's a very uh, important target for them. I'm not at all surprised that uh, they knew she'd arrived in Paris from the Mediterranean with uh, Dodi al Fayed. Uh, they must have been following her around town. It's interesting that she had a driver and a bodyguard. We don't know who the bodyguard was at this stage. It was interesting that she felt and he felt that uh, uh, they needed these people with, with her because they are followed all the time. And, of course, one can't say in Paris what caused that crash because those roads along the Seine run very, very fast indeed. And any kind of accident is liable to lead to a pile-up, as it has done in this case. I've just been told that uh, Prince of Wales has been informed, and therefore one assumes that their two sons have also been informed. But I... I was uh, listening to an eyewitness earlier, a French eyewitness at the scene. Now, he and he wasn't entirely clear as to what had happened, but uh, he did refer to Mr. al being dead. He said that he thought that Diana had walked away from this uh, uh, crash because she said something. He saw a woman who looked like her talking um, and obviously in a distressed state, but the indication he gave was that she was able to walk at that stage. Now, if she's also received visits from the interior minister and one of the British embassy staff, that would indicate that uh, she, she would be in a fit state to receive visitors. So you, at the moment, we're trying to check whether this eyewitness is correct. Of course, it can also be said that uh, in this kind of situation, the consul would be informed immediately. Yes. Uh, it would be interesting to know whether he is the British consul um, technically responsible for uh, any British national at whichever level, whether they actually, the British Embassy knew that she was in town. Well, I'm sure they knew she was in town. Um, she's still regarded as a very important person. She's still, in fact, regarded as a member of the royal family. So it's not quite sure whether she's a full member or not, but nevertheless... I'm, I'm sure the embassy must have known, um, though it's possible that she flew in without, without them knowing, but I, I think they must have known, and certainly they were, they were told uh, very soon afterwards. Could I then just ask you, Paul, about mm. what, I, what I was discussing with James a moment ago on this issue of Scotland Yard and uh, British security in a situation like this. What is your perspective in, in recent months about how she has been handling this and the kind of demand she has made or the kind of rejection she's made on security, given that certainly here in London, when she went off to um, her fitness uh, courses and her, her, her hours when she was uh, uh, doing those kind of exercises, she certainly did drive herself. She did. Well, she's, she's been living in this very grey area where um, the very phrase she is regarded as a member of the royal family doesn't sort of tell you whether she is or she isn't. And therefore, well, how is it she, seen publicly and, she, and legally and also by right. Scotland Yard? Well, she is in this very grey area. As James said, she dispensed with her own guards uh, some time ago. They do appear on official occasions and, as, as he said, when, they, when her sons are with her. But, you know, this could be a consequence um, of her wanting a more free life 
and yet those photographers will follow her everywhere. She had an incident here recently where a member of the public actually intervened and ripped the film from a photographer's camera at her request. So she's constantly being uh, followed around by them. She is their number one target, and she is not in a clear position as to whether she should have uh, protection. She doesn't want it for her private reasons. On public occasions she does. But, of course, it's those private occasions that the photographers are after. Paul, stay with us for one moment, because I'm now joined by Nick Hyam, our media correspondent. Uh, Nick, uh, welcome to the program. Uh, we were talking to James Whitaker, the uh, royal correspondent for the Mirror newspaper, and he was very resentful of the instant accusation that what we loosely call the paparazzi, the freelance photographers who've been going around Paris, as they do with every leading figure, might have been to blame for this. What's your perspective on this? Uh, yes, well, of course, uh, he would naturally uh, uh, think that. It does look as if there was at least one photographer who was present at the, at the scene of the crash. One eyewitness says that within, uh, by her reckoning, five seconds of the crash, there was a photographer taking pictures of what had happened, and that would tend to bear out the suggestion that at least one one photographer on a, uh, a motorbike had been trailing the, the car, and the, the, the scenario that has been uh, painted is of uh, a car which was being driven too fast in an attempt to get away from a photographer. Now, we don't know for certain that that is, is, is the case, uh, but it is clearly quite possible, and I think it is uh, without a shadow of a doubt that uh, the princess has been... Uh, all, ever since her marriage, and particularly in recent years, of intense interest to photographers and, and, and the paparazzi, as they're called. Uh, there is uh, very large sums of money to be made from uh, photographs of uh, the princess. One American magazine paid $200,000 just the other day for the North American rights to the photographs of her with uh, Dodi Al-Fayed. And if you are the um, freelance photographer who is lucky enough to get um, a particularly good, a particularly revealing photograph, then you can make a great deal of money. Uh, and for that reason, she is constantly pursued. So whether or not they were involved in, in, this, in this case, I think um, uh, it's, uh, it's fair to say that um, she has lived her life um, for many years now under the pressure of very intense scrutiny from the media and uh, the attentions of photographers. But Nick, we were hearing from Paul discussing with the former royal correspondent Paul Reynolds a moment ago, um, this grey area in which she has found herself, partly by her own wish, when it came to security. We're now talking about a grey area when it comes to photographers, because, of course, there have been difficulties with some of the British newspapers over her being stewed, stalk, uh, pursued, stalked, some would say. Um, and uh, here we have the problem of freelance photographers who technically are beholden to nobody except those who choose to buy their pictures at the end of the day. Yes, I think the, the people who tend to do the stalking are freelance photographers. Um, you have to distinguish here between the kind of coverage that um, you get in the newspapers at the end of the day and the people on the ground who are actually doing the job. The people who... Um, tend to go around with the, the long lens cameras trying to snatch photographs of the princess at, at, uh, all, all, in all kinds of locations and at all kinds of times, by and large are uh, freelance paparazzi. Uh, the staff photographers from the British newspapers um, tend to be rather more organized. The, um, uh, the, 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 the royal family down the years has uh, developed a, a system of um, uh, 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 corralling journalists, as it were, offering them uh, photo opportunities and offering them a in which they can talk to the royals or, or take photographs of them. And that's the system in which the staff photographers of the British newspapers, uh, for the most part, participate. I mean, they do go off on their own and try and catch, uh, snap um, uh, unauthorized photographs, but uh, it's principally the paparazzi who do that. Now, that's very difficult to, uh, to police, because even if the newspapers in Britain won't buy some of the photographs that these people take, and they won't because they believe that uh, uh, it would be going too far and invading the royals' privacy to publish them, there are always magazines and newspapers in other parts of the world who will pay, as I say, very large sums of money. Nick, for the moment, uh, can we just pause there? Because uh, I am now joined by another of our Paris correspondents, Stephen Jessel. And we have uh, new pictures, Stephen, of the wreckage in the tunnel at Pont d'Alma, which is just to the west of the centre of Paris. Stephen, what information is coming through to you in Paris? Well, very little at the moment. We know, or at least we think we know, that there are two dead in this accident. That is Dodi El Fayed and the driver of the car. There are two injured, uh, the princess, who is supposed to be seriously injured, and a bodyguard, and we do not know the state of, of his injuries at the moment. 
it was, um, I think you'll probably see from the pictures, a, a nasty accident. Several vehicles were involved. The princess's car was very badly damaged. She has been taken to hospital. The interior minister, Jean-Pierre Chevenement, the head of the Paris police, uh, Philippe Massoni, and a senior official from the British Embassy have gone to the princess's bedside. We don't at the moment know which hospital she's in, nor do we know the extent of her injuries. How dangerous are these underpasses? We do have pictures reminding us of the scene. Well, intrinsically, they're not particularly dangerous. Um, all big cities with heavy traffic problems have underpasses. Um, there are many along the banks of the Seine going in both directions. They become dangerous, clearly, if you have a car being driven at high speed by somebody who's trying to escape um, the attentions of paparazzi, or which you're... you're well, your other guest was talking about, um, uh, we can't say at this stage exactly what happened. It, it isn't known whether it was a head-on collision or whether the, thing, the car bounced off a wall or whatever. But there is nothing intrinsically dangerous about a, um, an underpass. W when it becomes dangerous is when a car has to maneuver at high speed in dangerous circumstances. One of the suggestions from the images I'm looking at is that the car may have been going the wrong way down this tunnel or has been swung round very violently. Uh, that uh, I, I, I can't comment upon. It would be an extraordinary manoeuvre to try and uh, do a U-turn in the middle of one of these tunnels. I know them quite well. I, uh, I, dr I drive that way occasionally myself. It would be, uh, especially at midnight on a Saturday evening, when there is an enormous amount of traffic, um, some of it <coughs> involving people who are not wholly sober, it would be an extremely dangerous manoeuvre to undertake. Um, it may be that the shock of the, of the impact simply spun the car around, but at this stage we just don't have enough information to really to speculate usefully about it. Stephen, here we have the interior minister, Jean-Pierre Chevenement, actually going to the hospital. What do you read into that? Well, the Princess Di is, um, Princess Diana, Diana Princess of Wales, is a, a figure of world standing. Um, it, only the other day, Le Monde ran, the, which is a very serious newspaper, ran an entire page of an interview with her. Uh, some of the statements attributed to her were later denied by, Ken, by, by the uh, Princess's private office. So I think most people think the article was a fairly accurate reflection of... Um, of what she said. The fact of the matter is that the princess is the mother of the future King of England. Uh, as such, she is a, an extremely senior and important figure on the diplomatic scene. And I don't think it's at all surprising that, that Mr. Chevenement has gone there, though, as it happens, he is a, a well-known Republican and uh, not a great believer in royalty. But it's his duty as the, as the equivalent of the Home Secretary in Britain, as the senior minister in charge of internal affairs after the Prime Minister, it would certainly be his duty um, to take an interest in a case which involves so, hope, high, so high profile a figure as, as the Princess. How much coverage has this all been getting in, in France, her visits and her relationship with Dodi al -Faid? Relatively little. It depends which, which bit of the press you're talking about. I mean, there is a, a scandal press in France, uh, magazines such as uh, Voici and Gala and so forth, who, are, <clears throat> who will take, and Perry Match or something said, who will take almost anything on the princess and pay very large sums of money for it. The more sober press is, is less excited by her. Uh, there was a good deal of comment about the fact that a British newspaper appeared to have um, computer-enhanced a picture to show her in a more intimate uh, conversation with Mr. Fayed than was in fact the case if you looked at the original. That was commented upon, but more as a, an example of what the British press will do. Now, it was not known that she was in Paris, and certainly it hadn't been publicized, though clearly the paparazzi knew. As I understand it, she didn't get here until Saturday afternoon. She was staying at the Ritz, which of course is owned by Mr. Fayed's father. Um, and, um, but by and large, she doesn't excite the, the vast coverage she gets, certainly in Britain, um, certainly in the more serious newspapers here. But it is interesting that it was Le Monde, of all people, uh, and all, magazine, all newspapers, a daily, which is regarded as one of the heaviest of heavyweights in France, and in France. Uh, was granted some kind of access, even though some of it was denied. Yes, I mean, there was, there was no doubt at all that the interview took place, and there is no doubt at all that she spoke freely on a number of issues. Uh, this has to be put in context. The, the Le Monde was, has been running a series of uh, articles uh, relating to very famous pictures, um, pictures over the last 10 or 15 years, pictures which caught the world's attention. And there was one which involved uh, the princess and 
the reporter wrote to her and said, can I talk to you about this? And I think somewhat to the reporter's surprise, uh, Diana wrote back and said, yes, you may. And so the, the interview took place. Um, she does not give interviews uh, to the British press. She gave a, a famous television interview, but that, that was about it. So um, it was, as you say, on the face of it, slightly surprising that if she wanted to go public, she should do it uh, to a French newspaper. Uh, but I think she took the view, quite rightly, that Le Monde is a very serious newspaper and wasn't going to treat her remarks uh, in a sensational way. Stephen Jessel, our correspondent in Paris, stay with us. We're just going to recap now uh, on the news on which we've been uh, talking in, in the last few minutes. Welcome to BBC News. I'm Nick Gowing. Diana, Princess of Wales, has been seriously injured and her companion, Dodi al Faid, has been killed in a motor accident in the French capital, Paris. It is not clear how badly the princess has been hurt. A driver from the Ritz Hotel was also killed and the princess's bodyguard is said to be badly injured. After a high-speed car chase involving press photographers, Britain's Princess of Wales has been seriously injured in a car crash in Paris. The princess's companion, Dodi al Faid, and the car's chauffeur were killed in the accident. A bodyguard in the car was also badly injured. The French news agency says the French interior minister, Jean-Pierre Chevenement, and the British consul in Paris have both visited Princess Diana in hospital. The accident happened late at night in a road tunnel which carries an expressway under a bridge at the Place d'Alma across the River Seine. Reports say a vehicle carrying the princess and her entourage was being chased by a carload of paparazzi photographers. Police say her companion, the millionaire film producer Dodi al Faid, and the driver were both killed. Both the princess and her bodyguard were seriously hurt. A number of other vehicles were also involved in the accident. Police were still at the scene some hours after the crash. You can see the location there in the tunnel under the Pont d'Alma, where they've been cutting victims in other cars from the wreckage. The princess was divorced a year ago from her husband, Prince Charles, after a stormy 15-year marriage. A spokesman for Buckingham Palace in London noted that the incident occurred while the couple were being chased by paparazzi and said, in their words, it was an accident waiting to happen. Now we can return to our correspondent in Paris, Stephen Jessel. Stephen, uh, let's just pick up, if we can, the basic details for those just joining us at this moment on BBC News. What we know further about the incident in the tunnel under the Pont d'Alma, uh, which is just to the west of the centre of Paris. What we know is that sometime around midnight, uh, a car containing four people, a driver, a security guard, um, the princess and her companion, Dodi Fayed, was in a tunnel uh, at the uh, Pont de l'Alma, which is just, just slightly to the west of, the, of Paris. Um, it was involved in what was clearly a very serious crash. It is said, it is reported that Mr. Fayed is dead, as is the driver of the car. The princess has been badly injured, it is reported, so has the bodyguard. Um, they, the car appears to have been involved in a pileup with a number of other vehicles. There are some reports that it may have hit a wall. Uh, at least several other vehicles have been involved and the police are still on the scene. The princess has been taken to hospital. She's been visited there by the interior minister, Jean-Pierre Chevenement, the British consul general, and apparently the prefect of police, the head of the Paris police. It is not yet known which hospital she's in. We've had no report at all as to the extent of her injuries, how serious they are, how long she'll be in, in hospital. But we do know that there has been a serious accident on a uh, stretch of um, uh, in a tunnel, on a stretch of road in a tunnel, not in itself an unsafe uh, stretch of road, but it is said that the car was being pursued either by a carload of paparazzi, which is to say freelance photographers desperate for a, a picture they could sell, um, or according to some other reports, by people on motorcycles. That's slightly more likely, actually. Um, and that's about all we know at the moment. Stephen, uh, just to, to clarify, um, this location, the Pont d'Almar, is very close to the Eiffel Tower, for those who know Paris. Yeah, it's How far. far is it from the Ritz Hotel, which is owned by the al Faid family? Oh, not far. I mean, it depends which direction they were going in. I assume from the tunnel they were, they were probably going west, but they would have had to have... Uh, the, the Ritz um, is, is off the Rue de Rivoli. That's, it's, it's not very far. But, but it has to be remembered that on the Saturday night, there is a great deal of traffic in Paris. Um, it's a busy city, and even in the holiday season, which is coming to 
to an end. So, um, I mean, I've been down that area at that kind of night, and there is an awful lot of traffic. So, uh, and moving at high speed at that time of well, night. Well, yes, it might well be, and, and not all of the drivers necessarily entirely sober at, at, at midnight, uh, which is when the accident occurred. Um, it's not intrinsically dangerous, but um, it's not a place you would want to be involved in a high-speed chase in. Stephen Jessel, our correspondent in Paris for the moment, thank you very much for updating us on the latest news from the French capital. Well, let's uh, pursue some of the other issues which have now emerged since the news of the accident happened. I'm joined now by Nick Hyam, our media correspondent. Uh, we were talking about half an hour ago about this issue of the paparazzi, Nick, um, and it does appear that Buckingham Palace is still saying or indicating that that could have been a cause of this accident. Do you think that this is now going to be a serious problem or is it something which really will be accepted as part of everyday life, whichever way um, this now uh, uh, develops this? I, I think if you're someone like Princess Diana, it's been a serious problem for many years. Um, uh, she, along with a, a, a relatively small number of international stars and, and, and people who can be guaranteed to appear in, in, in gossip columns and magazines around the world, are the object of this very, very intense scrutiny. They are pursued or stalked by photographers, with, uh, often with long lenses, often on motorbikes. Um, the princess has been involved in a number of altercations down the years with, with photographers and, with, and, and and cameraman. There was one occasion last year when she was visiting a, uh, the, the, the home of a therapist and uh, she uh, attempted to run away from a group of photographers who were uh, standing in the street waiting to, to, to picture her as she came out. Um, uh, I think it was earlier this year there was another altercation in a London street when a man um, came to her rescue, a passerby came to her rescue when she um, accosted one of these photographers and we asked him now, to go we away. We are now at this moment seeing images of her um, in Bosnia a couple of weeks ago when she visited Sarajevo just after one of her uh, more recent uh, meetings with Dodi al Faid in the Mediterranean when she went on this uh, demining uh, operation. Yes, of course, this is an example of the princess using her undoubted celebrity and the fascination that she has for newspapers and, and uh, photographers and television organizations around the world uh, to positive end. I mean, she does have something of a love-hate relationship with the, uh, the media. She does dislike intensely the, 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 the way she is pursued, but she's also aware of her own value. She's also aware of the, 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 the fact that um, there is intense interest, and she has in the past used this in, in, uh, for to help various good causes, various charities, and her campaign uh, to hold landmines, which is what took her to uh, Bosnia and took her um, uh, earlier this year to uh, southern Africa, her campaign to, to, to get landmines banned is a very good example of her using that celebrity. She, the very fact that she um, uh, goes to these countries and, and uh, is, is pursued is a guarantee that the issue will suddenly go to the top of the, uh, the political agenda in any number of countries because uh, photographs of her will be published everywhere and, and, and people will have to take note. Um, so she's not beyond using her uh, celebrity and there are people who say that um, at one and the same time she dislikes the intense pressure of being constantly in the public eye but does rather like constantly being photographed in glamorous poses and attractive dresses and appearing in newspapers and magazines and on front covers. Uh, and and uh, I, I think uh, uh, the fact that she is aware of her own celebrity has not made it easier for her. She, she does find it very difficult not to smile for the photographers when she sees them, uh, not to put on, a, put on a show. Well, Nick, let me uh, bring in uh, our former court correspondent at the BBC, uh, Paul Reynolds, who joins me from another of our studios in central London. Paul, can we just take up that point that Nick Hyam, our media correspondent, was making? What's your guess, and we can only guess at the moment, about whether she sees this kind of visit to Paris, short notice, a reasonably short visit, as something which is totally private, and she wouldn't ever expect to see a photographer there? Well, she'd certainly expect to see them, because after what's happened in the last few weeks with her friendship with Mr. al Fayed, she knows perfectly well that every move she makes is followed. And Would she course... be expecting to be able to evade them, though, Paul? She might have a try. Of course, we're, we're making a, one or two assumptions that Indeed. they were trying to evade the, the press, and that might be unfair on the photographers. Uh, that, as Stephen was saying earlier, th that traffic in Paris along those motorways along the Seine moves extremely fast, and uh, any number of things could have happened. But, of course, one has to say that a possibility is that they were travelling fast to try to get away from the photographers. We don't know yet. Uh, we'll have to wait uh, what further police reports on that. 
But yes, this is a constant thing. She will certainly have known that they were there. They must have picked her up uh, hours before, uh, and uh, they'd been at the Brits, apparently, and she must have known they were there. So however she arrives in a place like Paris, or indeed London, whether it be on private executive jet or somehow incognito on a scheduled flight, it is virtually impossible uh, that she could actually get into the country uh, unseen. It is virtually impossible these days. There is an industry has grown up around her uh, which depends on her and which makes a lot of money out of her. And, of course, the very private moments which she wants are those very moments which the photographers uh, want as well. Paul, for the moment, thank you very much indeed. Uh, we'll take up those issues in a moment. But first, let's uh, get the latest information and the details of what has happened in Paris from Maxime Marwini, who joins me from the International Desk. Maxime. Nick, as you've been hearing, uh, Princess Diana has been seriously injured. We hear that she's been treated in the emergency room of a Paris public hospital. Um, her companion, Dodi Al-Fayed, is dead. His father, Mohammed Al-Fayed, who's the owner of the Harrods Group in London, we believe is on his way to Paris now by helicopter, but the Harrods spokespeople are not confirming or denying reports of the accident. No one is really speaking. There's a, a tight lid being kept on all of this at the moment. Very little information from Buckingham Palace as well, apart from one comment um, related to those reports that the paparazzi had been chasing the car in which the princess and Dodi al Fayed had been traveling. They said it was an accident waiting to happen. Questions being raised, of course, about the pursuit of the princess. Apparently, the couple had arrived in Paris on Saturday afternoon, had had dinner at the Ritz Hotel, which is owned by Dodi al Fayed's father, Mohammed al Fayed. And then when they left the hotel in their car, according to press reports, uh, they were chased and pursued by the media on motorcycles. That's all we know for the moment, Nick. Maxine, thank you very much indeed. Uh, so just to recap that uh, Princess Diana has been seriously hurt uh, in a car accident in central Paris and her companion Dodi al Fayed was killed, as was the driver. This is the scene in Paris. Uh, the location is the Pont d'Alma, which is very close to the Eiffel Tower. Uh, on the northern bank of the Seine and the accident happened uh, towards midnight Paris time. That is the scene of the accident that one of the cars in the tunnel uh, under the bridge known as the Pont d'Alma uh, in Paris. We'll bring you the latest from Paris as we get that information. But first, let's look at other news at this hour. An American envoy has warned hardline Bosnian Serbs of serious consequences if they continue to undermine the Dayton Peace Accord. Robert Gelbard described recent attacks on international peacekeepers as terrorist tactics. And he told supporters of Radovan Karadzic, the Republic's former president, also wanted for war crimes, that Western powers will not hesitate to use force if they don't stop opposing the elected president, Biljana Plavsic. His position has been backed by NATO ambassadors in Brussels, who stress that NATO-led troops in Bosnia would not tolerate attempts to intimidate them. Tough-talking Americans are nothing new for the Bosnian Serbs. But with the Serbs divided, Western support is clearly with Biljana Plavšić. The stern words are for her enemies in Pale. As the Pale group has seen the development of real-life opposition in recent months, it has reacted as it has reacted before, in the most violent, undemocratic ways. The hardline Serbs have gone too far, is the message, and this is their last warning. We won't accept promises, we won't accept statements of commitment, we're only interested in concrete, positive results. Earlier, in the other half of the Bosnian Serb statelet, Mr. Gelbart came to read the riot act to the hardliners accused of trying to sabotage the Dayton Agreement by defying both NATO and Mrs. Plavšić. For the first time since NATO bombed them two years ago, the Serbs were warned that force could be used again. The Serbs listened but appeared unmoved. Momčilo Krajšnik said threats would achieve nothing. And there was no response to the charge that Pale was behind Thursday's attacks on NATO troops in the town of Burčko, in which two Americans were wounded. 
The dilemma for NATO is that however much they may threaten the dissident Serbs, the prime cause of all their troubles, indicted war criminal Radovan Karadzic, remains at large and apparently well supported. His continuing freedom is NATO's most awkward obstacle in the way of peace in Bosnia. Jim Fish, BBC News. The British government has won a high court injunction preventing a Sunday newspaper from publishing further revelations by the former MI5 intelligence officer David Shaler. The British Home Secretary Jack Straw said that publication of material in last week's newspaper had endangered the lives of intelligence agents. The newspaper denied the allegation and called the ban an attack on press freedom designed to cover up MI5 embarrassment. The Mail on Sunday rolled off the presses tonight without any further revelations from David Shaler. Instead, the paper featured an interview with his girlfriend, another former MI5 officer who's strongly critical of the way the service was run. There was a clear message, too, for the government on the paper's front page. Well, that's very bad news, isn't it? I mean, this is a grim day for the British press. The Mail on Sunday's editor was given first news of the injunction by the company's lawyers this afternoon. The case was considered in private by a High Court judge after the Attorney General had expressed concern that David Shaler was jeopardising national security. Mr Shaler spoke last week to the newspaper and to Newsnight about his activities as an MI5 officer. Today's injunction was described as political censorship. I cannot understand why uh, this action has been taken. The Mail on Sunday uh, last week was extremely responsible about what it disclosed about MI5. Uh, it disclosed nothing that put any agents at risk, whatever the Director General of MI5 might uh, claim. The government says it has no wish to stifle debate about the security services, but the sensitive information published by the Mail on Sunday left no alternative. We cannot have a situation where the lives of British operatives or the fight against terrorism is put at risk. It was put at risk last Sunday by the Mail on Sunday. We could get no guarantees whatever, which were meaningful, that it would not be put at risk again this Sunday. Civil liberties campaigners believe the government is resorting to the law without proper justification. Unfortunately, it's very easy for the government to wave the national security flag and for the courts to adopt that and for nothing whatsoever to be published, even though some of it, I'm sure, was in the public interest. Senior executives of Associated Newspapers are considering whether to appeal against today's ruling but that's unlikely to take place until a full injunction hearing, which is expected at the High Court next week. Paul Newman, BBC News, at the Mail on Sunday. Britain and the Philippines are to take joint action against so-called sex tourists who visit the Philippines to abuse children. In Manila, the British Foreign Secretary, Robin Cook, signed an agreement which will allow both countries to exchange intelligence on known or suspected child abusers. Britain is also to operate a training program for the Philippines police. From Manila, our diplomatic correspondent Nicholas Witchell now reports. Nighttime in one of the red light areas of Manila. The clubs are crowded, the hustlers and prostitutes are busy, and somewhere in the shadows are foreign paedophiles who come to Manila from all over the world. They're attracted by the Philippines' street children, tens of thousands of youngsters, some little more than infants, who are vulnerable and in many cases available to unscrupulous adults. The Foreign Secretary visited a refuge which cares for such children. The youngsters performed the street children's song. Children are human too, say the words, entitled to the human right of a safe life. Mr Cook called the sexual exploitation of children an unforgivable crime. He apologised for the fact that two of the three foreigners so far convicted in the Philippines for child sex abuse came from Britain, and he had a warning for any other British paedophiles thinking of coming here. If you come here, we will catch you and you will be punished. These children are being protected not just by the Philippine authorities who are doing excellent work, but also by the British police. Two agreements were signed, one to authorise extensive cooperation between the British and Philippines police to identify and track known or suspected paedophiles, the other for the British to train the Philippines police in the investigation of child abuse cases. Mr Cook and local officials said they hoped the agreements, the first of their kind, would be a model for other countries. 
So much does depend on implementation, but for their part, the Philippine authorities insist that they are determined to stop foreign paedophiles from coming here. If they do come, and if they are caught, as should now be more likely, they face long prison sentences or even the death penalty. Nicholas Witchell, BBC News, Manila. There's been another surge of volcanic activity on the Caribbean island of Montserrat. The latest eruption came as the first practical emergency aid was being brought ashore. From Montserrat, our correspondent Ben Brown reports. Montserrat's volcano erupted again today, sending a vast mushroom cloud of ash spiralling over the island and reminding everyone here of its enduring power. Avalanches of gas and molten rock rolled down the slopes in an area that's already been evacuated so the authorities hope no one's been killed or injured. The volcano has been relatively quiet for the last few days, but now it's sprung back into life. Montserratians have learned through painful experience never to take it for granted. And the scientists here have told them it could be lethally dangerous for years to come. More people did leave the island today, but the evacuation programme has now changed. British officials are no longer laying on special boats. Instead, they're giving evacuees vouchers, which get them seats on the usual daily ferry crossing to Antigua. Some islanders who are staying, even though they're now homeless, live in schools, which means that children won't have anywhere to learn when their new term starts next month, an outrage, according to Montserrat's chief minister. If there's one thing we do, you must not cause any impediment the education of your children and your health program. This weekend, emergency British government aid has been arriving in Montserrat in the shape of prefabricated buildings. Montserratians, though, are angry that other aid programs have been frozen by Whitehall, which is waiting to see how many of the population are left before it ploughs more money into this island. Ben Brown, BBC News, Montserrat. Well, we can now return to our main story about Diana, Princess of Wales, who's been involved in a serious car crash in central Paris. The princess is said to have been badly hurt in the crash, which happened in a road tunnel by the Seine in the French capital. French police have announced that Princess Diana's companion, the millionaire Harrods heir, Dodi al Faid, was killed in the accident. The car's chauffeur also died and a bodyguard was injured. According to reports, the princess's car was being pursued by press photographers on motorcycles when the accident happened. The princess has been taken for emergency treatment to a public hospital in the French capital. She has been visited by the French interior minister and the British consul. According to the French press agency, the princess has suffered concussion, a broken arm and serious cuts to her thigh in this accident. Well, for the latest, we can now join Maxime Mawini at the international desk. Let's just recap on the details of those injuries, Maxime. Yes, Nick. What they're saying is the princess is in the intensive care unit of a southeast Paris hospital. She has concussion, a broken arm and apparently serious cuts to her thigh. The British ambassador, Sir Michael Jay, is at the hospital and, quote, is in control of the situation. The British Prime Minister, Tony Blair, has been awakened and is being kept informed of what has been going on. Now, um, the princess's companion, Dodi Al-Fayed, the son of the Harrods boss, Mohammed Al-Fayed, was, of course, killed in the accident. We believe now from reports that Mohammed Al-Fayed is flying to Paris by private helicopter at this moment um, to be at the scene. The chauffeur was killed, as you said, and the bodyguard was seriously injured and is being treated in the same hospital as the princess. And we can see the pictures there of the crash itself. Um, the scene of the crash had occurred in the tunnel. We can see some of the damage. It was several hours, we know, um, after the event. They were still trying to remove um, the debris and cut some people from the wreckage. Obviously made doubly difficult because of the location of this crash inside the tunnel. Uh, witnesses said it took several minutes for the police and emergency services to actually get to the scene. We can see there the emergency services at the scene earlier. Maxine, and one you. of the cars, of course. Yeah, you can see the uh, one of the cars there badly uh, crunched. Yes, eyewitness reports from the scene, Nick, say that it uh, d describe it as a terrible accident, a terrible scene, smoke billowing from the area, airbags which we've just seen there had exploded. It does seem to have been a rather 
dreadful accident indeed. At a busy time of night in the French capital. Exactly. Uh, the couple were coming, in fact, from the Ritz Hotel. They'd arrived in Paris earlier on Saturday, had dinner at the Ritz, which is owned by Mohammed Al-Fayed, Dodi Al-Fayed's father. And according to local press reports, when they left the Ritz after dinner in their car, that's when the press chase began or the alleged press chase reports from the scene say they were being pursued by photographers on motorcycles at the time. Maktin, for the moment, thank you very much indeed for updating us from the international desk on the latest news from Paris after the accident involving uh, Princess of Wales, Diana Princess of Wales. Well, on the line now from Paris is our correspondent Stephen Jessel. Stephen, we understand that the princess is being treated in the intensive care unit at the Petit Salpetriere uh, hospital, which is in southeast Paris. Is yes, this it, uh, hospital known to you? Yes, it is. It's, uh, there's a, a street, a boulevard of hospitals um, down in the 13th arrondissement, not very far, in fact, from where the accident occurred. And La Pitié, uh, La Pitié Salpetriere is a very well-known hospital. She is certainly going to receive extremely good medical care, though. From, what, uh, from the reports, it does appear that though clearly she has been badly shaken and she has a broken arm and cuts and concussion, she does appear to have escaped relatively, and I emphasize relatively lightly from this accident, given that uh, two of the other people in the car were killed. Uh, concussion obviously is, is, is uh, unpleasant and she's got the broken arm uh, and the, the, the lacerations to her thigh, but um, it could have been a great deal more serious. What kind of hospital is it, Stephen? I, it's a teaching hospital, uh, as, as I recall. As I say, there are down on the 13th arrondissement, down the 13th arrondissement, a series of, of big hospitals. Um, the French tend to go in for, for concentrating their hospitals in, in the, these large units. Um, it has a very good reputation. How far away from the incident at the Pont d'Alma? Oh, it's, it's in the 13th arrondissement. I would have thought uh, that you'd have to cross the river, then go down through the 15th, 40th. I would have thought it was a couple of miles, even so. Um, to a couple of miles, three or four kilometers, yeah. But um, uh, she would clearly have been in, a, um, in, a, uh, in a, an ambulance, with, probably with police outriders, so it wouldn't have taken very long to get there. And just to underline, what kind of hospital is it? It's, it's, a, it's a general hospital. It has an accident, an emergency unit, but it, it does have a reputation as a teaching hospital. It's, uh, it's, it's a very large establishment um, with a very good reputation um, and uh, not particularly specialised in accidents and emergency, but general medicine, but certainly um, one that's uh, well known and respected by the, by the Parisian public. Now, we understand that the British ambassador to France, Sir Michael Jay, uh, is at the hospital and, according to one report, is uh, in control of the situation. You know Sir Michael well. I know him. I, would, I wouldn't presume to say I know him well. But uh, he's uh, a relatively new ambassador. He's uh, a career diplomat, clearly. He's made a very good impression in his first, first months here. Um, it would be entirely logical for him to go as the, as the ambassador, the United Kingdom's ambassador in France. It would be entirely logical for him to go uh, when you say when it's said that he's in charge of the situation of course the doctors at the hospital will be in charge but clearly he'll be coordinating the extremely tricky business uh, we will have to find out whether the uh, the princess is, is in, in any condition to travel i imagine she'll want to get back to the united kingdom as fast as possible provided the concussion isn't too serious then there's no obvious reason why she shouldn't return um, relatively quickly i think after the terrible experience she's had over the last few hours, she'll want to get home back to England just as soon as she can. But I would have thought that being in control of the situation at the hospital is important for the British ambassador because this is now uh, a problem of enormous proportions, both in terms of the princess's condition after the, uh, the accident and also because of the management of it now. Well, yes, so there will clearly have to be a, 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 an investigation into how and why this accident happened. There does seem to be a substantial consensus that it happened because the car was traveling extremely fast um, in an effort to shake off uh, photographers, paparazzi, who, as I understand it, were on motorcycles rather than trailing in, in another car. Um, if you're in another car, it's not a particularly good way to snatch photographs because you're obviously blocked behind the vehicle you're, you're pursuing. Um, there will have to be an, inv in, an investigation into how this happened and doubtless police might want to question uh, the princess about the circumstances of the accident but she wasn't driving she was a passenger in the car um, and I don't think uh, anybody will be in 
any particular hurry to detain her, prevent her leaving Brown, so I imagine she'll want to get back and see her sons and, and her family um, as fast as possible after an event that must leave the most awful traces uh, for the rest of her life. Now, we are talking about an incident uh, involving so-called paparazzi, which, of course, is the Italian nickname for a large number of mobile photographers who tend to try and uh, track down and follow leading celebrities like Princess Diana. What's the attitude in France to these, these photographers? Because, as uh, I know from my experience in Paris, uh, watching big events there, they swoop around the capital on motorbikes at high speed, frightening speed. And this is not unique, is it, in terms of incidents which might have been caused because of the uh, overzealousness of uh, photographers? Well, there is a great deal of money to be made, huge sums of money to be made, if you get the right picture. And uh, there have been stakeouts. Uh, particularly in the south of France. I'm thinking of a famous occasion in which uh, Princess Stephanie of Monaco's then husband uh, was photographed in a very compromising position with a, a Belgian beauty queen. Now, uh, the, the paparazzo who got that photograph had spent a very long time uh, in extremely uncomfortable circumstances waiting to get that picture. Uh, the French uh, and the Italians, and it has to be said to some extent the British too, uh, these freelance photographers, they know the stakes involved. There are huge sums of money to be made. But has there been any backlash against it, Stephen? Well, not really, because... Um, the, the French have, a, have very strict rules about private life. For example, in France, you own your image. If you don't, in theory, if you don't want your picture to appear somewhere, you can say no, and you've got a right to do that. Now, in fact, that isn't respected because certain newspapers do, or magazines rather, do regularly publish compromising and embarrassing photographs, and then they're taken to court. But they're fine such small sums. It doesn't actually amount to much of a, a disincentive. Um, it's true to say that you do not have, in France, anything like the British tabloid press. Uh, with, it, with its uh, mania for, for compromising and titillating photographs. But let's be fair, though. A lot of the, what you call the tabloid press, use the pictures from these kind of photographers. Yes, and some of them are French, and some of them are Italian, and some of them are German, and some of them are British. All I'm saying is that although there are magazines like uh, Voici and, to some extent, Paris Match, who will publish these photographs, they tend to appear in magazines where people know what they're going to find. You don't have the bidding wars you have uh, between tabloid newspapers in Britain. But essentially, there's not a public outcry. I'm speaking from Britain, where, after all, there are certain constraints or attempted constraints on this, and Princess Diana has herself tried on several occasions and actually on one occasion ripped the film out of a camera's, uh, cameraman's camera. I recall the incident. No, you don't. That kind of thing tends not to happen in, in, in Paris, though I can think offhand of one or two uh, incidents where, uh, in particular, a well-known television um, news announcer who's a slightly controversial figure is alleged to have attacked a photographer who took pictures of him when he was on holiday and uh, tore up his press card and did various things like that. But it isn't perceived as quite the problem. It may be uh, perceived as being in Britain. And, of course, there was the uh, celebrated problem with Princess Mitterrand's illegitimate uh, daughter, Mazarine. Well, yes, except that everybody, when I say everybody, certainly most people in the media had known all about Mazarine for years and years and years. But they um, didn't talk about it or publish pictures. No, because there is, there, I say there is, it's been more accurate to say there was this self-deny ordinance whereby people's private lives are people's private lives. I mean, there is an awful lot of fairly well-known gossip in France uh, by people in the media and so forth about the private lives of various people, but it doesn't appear in the, in the newspapers or in the magazines, partly because there is this belief that a private life is a private life. So I'm bound to say that is changing. Stephen, for the moment, uh, as we look at images from the tunnel at the Pont d'Alma in central Paris, where just before midnight Paris time, uh, Princess Diana was seriously hurt and her companion, Dodi al Faid was killed along with the chauffeur of a car which was taking them from dinner at the Ritz Hotel. Those are the images we're seeing now uh, on the banks of the Seine. Stephen, for the moment, thank you very much indeed. I'm now joined from another of our London studios by the BBC's royal correspondent, Paul Reynolds. Paul, you were listening, I hope, there to Stephen Jessel in Paris talking about the so-called freedom of uh, the image uh, in Paris. In other words, people can actually own their images even if these freelance photographers pursue them here, there and everywhere. Yes, but that, of course, only applies in France, and these people are selling pictures all around the world. And uh, so in France, there are very, very strict laws on privacy. 
in Britain, not so much. Though there is a press code of conduct here, it's a voluntary code to which the, which the newspapers themselves drew up, and it's supposed to stop things like long lenses being used to uh, take pictures of people on private property, that kind of thing. And there is a press complaints commission uh, which does uh, adjudicate on these uh, things, and that has tightened things up a lot. But of course, you know, no, no rules in one country, no law in another country are going to stop these kind of uh, photographers chasing Diana because she she has been, she is such tremendously valuable material for them and it's it, it's a it's a market which they do well of out of and they, they, they dedicate their lives to it in some cases. Now again we don't know whether they cause this crash. We've you've seen the pictures of the motorways along the Seine. They're very fast roads and uh, we don't know the cause of this. It could be that if the driver was from the Ritz, maybe was he well trained, was he a very experienced driver? We, that's another question to, w to which an answer <coughs> has to be found. <coughs> well, let's say uh, that the jury is out on that and we'll wait for the information uh, as it comes in. But what would you say about the difference in culture, Paul, between what happens in France, where we do have these large numbers of extremely mobile photographers who zoom around on their little mopeds and so on, and what happens in London? Is there the same kind of culture even among the freelancers here? Well, it's not so dissimilar. It's not so dissimilar because of the money that can be made. Uh, of course, photographers here get more access to her on official functions, and that keeps some of them going. But there are lots of them who, who, who do try to follow her around. Uh, but of course, as I say, the, the, the British press have a code of conduct uh, which does stop some of it, but I, I don't want to give the impression that uh, uh, that you know all is good in one place and all is bad in another, because it's not. This is an international trade. She's an international figure, and internationally these pictures sell, and they sell for many, many tens of thousands of dollars. Now it may be seen by some as, as bad taste to mm. even be discussing this issue of uh, uh, of photographers when uh, the princess's companion has been killed, uh, a driver has been killed. Yet this is surely central to the public debate there will be about this. Um, what view does Buckingham Palace take about this, given that uh, not so long ago we were talking about this grey area in which Princess Diana finds herself, partly of her own accord? Yeah, she, she, the divorce took place just over a year ago. I think one has to stress all along what a terrible tragedy this is uh, for the fired family and for her, because the divorce, I think, was a year ago on Thursday, and just at the moment when she seemed to be putting her life back together again, she seemed to be able to have the freedom to move around and develop new friendships and relationships. You know, this happens. But of course, people are going to ask, was this accident caused by the press chasing her? It's going to be a very serious issue, and uh, her spokesman, Michael Gibbons, who is working in London at the moment, said this was an accident waiting to happen. The, the palace fight a constant battle, even on her behalf, although she's no longer, as it were, an intimate member of the royal family, she's still regarded as a member of the royal family, in the official phrase, and therefore they, they act on her behalf and try to help her. But she does have this free life, and she, she's, she's neither royal nor she's non-royal. So she's, there is a grey area in which she doesn't want too many officials around or too many, too many men in grey suits. There are those, freedom. Paul, who say that uh, there is a degree of calculation sometimes by Princess Diana about how she will allow herself to be seen by these freelancers. Yes, there are moments when obviously she knows she's being photographed and there are other moments when she deliberately uses them in, in pursuance of some public campaign. Yes, she's tremendously photogenic and she, she knows it. But the difference between that, I think she would say, and being chased the whole time, but she knows the rules of the game. Basically, one of there the rule are no rules. Hasn't, well, exactly. One of the rules surely has already been broken, which is that several weeks ago, and we were talking to James Whitaker, the royal correspondent of the Mirror newspaper here, uh, about an hour ago. Uh, several weeks ago, when uh, he was down in the Mediterranean and she was down in the Mediterranean, uh, they were in the same place, but he was watching her from a great distance. Suddenly, she came across and began speaking to him. Well, and to a number of other uh, reporters, you know, that Indeed. was, that was well, so, well documented, yes. But so she is now, she has publicly decided at times to actually show that she knows they are there. She can't, avo you know, everybody knows they're there. She can't avoid not knowing they're there, avoid knowing they're there. And, and, and she is she's in this very, very difficult position. 
she wants them, she doesn't want them. She, she's, uh, they're attracted to her, she likes the attention on occasions, not on other occasions. There's this constant business of, you know, we're trying to have a private life while you're being a public figure. It's a balance that uh, she never quite got right. And if this accident was caused in any way by this, then I think there are going to be terrible recriminations uh, against the press, and people will be, you know, not just uh, in, the, in the Buckingham Palace kind of people in Britain. I think, you know, among ordinary people will say, well, really, you know, you must leave her alone. And especially now she's suffered this terrible tragedy. We were hearing from our correspondent Stephen Jessel just before we began discussing uh, here, Paul. And one of the issues he did raise was this I issue of the freedom of the image I in France yes. and that everyone owns their image. In other words, they can take legal action if they don't want a picture they know exists actually then being published. Could you imagine in this kind of situation that Princess Diana, knowing that she was being pursued by photographers, would have decided to take legal action in order to... Uh, well, that only, applies in, that only applies in France, you see. Those photo these photographers are not bound just by French law. They, there's nothing to stop them from chasing her on the public highway and taking pictures and then selling them in Britain or Italy or And then they filter else. back into France. But, yes, but in the, the French, I think the Duchess of York uh, has successfully taken action against a French magazine for publishing pictures of her while she was on private property. And you can take action in France. But that doesn't. That that's. There's a separate issue between the publication of the picture and the gathering of the picture. The gathering of the picture, it's open season, wherever she is, really, and uh, it's the publication, which which is constrained in some places. But this, I, I just come back to the basic point. There is so much money to be made out of her, that uh, you know all these rules and laws have not stopped. Do not stop. Uh, people chasing her, but you know, again, I also stress, you know, that's um, we we don't we don't know whether that caused the crash, but undoubtedly they were there. I think an eyewitness said the photographer was on the on the scene within five seconds, and maybe that was one of the people following her. We don't know. Paul, uh, thank you very much indeed for the moment. A reminder that we are seeing pictures here from central Paris after an incident several hours ago, just before midnight French time. Uh, in which Princess Diana, uh, the Princess of Wales, was uh, seriously injured in a car crash in which her companion, Dodi El Faid, was killed along with the driver of the car. These pictures of one of the cars involved in the incident underneath the bridge known as the Pont d'Alma in a tunnel, one of the fast-moving expressways on the banks of the Seine. Those pictures uh, came in about an hour ago.